Hi everyone, we are at the next section of the course, Create Truly Reusable Components. To create truly reusable components, we have to understand the different possibilities that React gives us for defining components and when it is better to choose one or another. In this section, we will see the different ways we can follow to create React components and when we should use one rather than the other. We will see stateless functional components and the difference between functional and stateful ones. We will also understand how the state works and when to avoid using it. Then we will see the importance to define clear prop types for each component and how to generate documentation dynamically from them with React DocGen. Finally, we will look at a real example of transforming a coupled component into a reusable one and create a living style guide to document our collection of reusable components using React Storybook. Now we move on to the first video of this section, Creating Classes. In this video, we will create classes using the Create Class Factory and extending React.Component. We will learn about the differences between the two and when to use one or the other. We will also understand stateless functional concepts. We have seen in the first section how React uses elements to display the components on the screen. Let's now look at the different ways in which we can define our components with React and the reasons why we should use one or the other technique. Let's start with the Create Class Factory. Looking at the React documentation, the first example we find shows us how to define components using React.CreateClass. Let's start with a very simple snippet. With the code above, we created a button and we can reference it inside other components in our application. We can change the snippet to use plain JavaScript like this. We can run the code everywhere without needing to use Babel for transpiling, which is a good way to start with React, avoiding the effort of learning different tools in the React ecosystem. Next, we will extend react.component. The second way to define a React component is by using the ES2015 classes. The class keyword is widely supported in modern browsers, but we can safely transpile it with Babel, which supposedly we already have in our stack if we are writing JSX. Let's see what it means to create the same button from the previous example using a class. This new way to define a component was released with React 0.13 and Facebook developers are pushing the community to use it. They want developers to use the latter since it's an ES2015 standard feature, while Create Class Factory is not. What are the main differences? Apart from the discrepancies regarding the syntax, there are some major differences that we have to keep in mind when you decide to use one or another. Let's go through all of them in detail so you can have all the information you need to choose the best way for the needs of your team and your project. First is props. The first difference is in how we can define the props that a component expects to receive and the default values for each one of the props. We will see how props work in detail further in this section, so let's now concentrate on how we can simply define them. With create class, we declare the props inside the object that we pass as a parameter to the function, and we use the get default props function to return the default values. As you can see, we use the prop types attribute to list all the props that we can pass to the component. We then use the get default props function to define the values that the props are going to have by default and which will be overwritten by the props passed from the parent if they are present. To achieve the same result using classes, we have to use a slightly different structure. Here it is. Since class properties are still in draft, to define the properties of the class, we have to set the attributes on the class itself after it has been created. As you can see in the example, the prop types object is the same we used with create class. When it comes to setting the default props instead, we used to use a function to return the default properties object, but with classes we have to define a default props attribute on the class and assign the default props to it. The good thing about using classes is that we just define properties on the JavaScript object without having to use React specific functions such as get default props.state. Another big difference between the create class factory and the extends react.component method is the way you define the initial state of the components. Again, 
With create class, we use a function, while with the ES2015 classes, we set an attribute of the instance. Let's see an example of that. The getInitialState method expects an object with the default values for each one of the state properties. However, with classes, we define our initial state using the state attribute of the instance and setting it inside the constructor method of the class, like this. This is our constructor placed here. These two ways of defining the state are equivalent, but, again, with classes, we just define properties on the instance without using any React specific APIs, which is good. In ES2015, to use this in subclasses, we first must call super. In the case of React, we also pass the props to the parent. Next, we have auto binding. Create class has a cool feature that is pretty convenient, but it can also hide the way JavaScript works, which is misleading, especially for beginners. This feature lets you create event handlers, assuming that, when they get called, this references the component itself. Write code for the browser. For now, we are only interested in the way they are bound to the components we are defining. Let's start with a simple example. With create class, we can set an event handler in this way and rely on the fact that this inside the function refers to the component itself. Because of this, we can, for example, call other methods of the same component instance. Calling this.setState or any other functions would work as expected. Let's now see how this works differently with classes and what we can do to create the same behavior. We could define a component extending react.component like here. The result would be a null output in the console when the button is clicked. This is because our function gets passed to the event handler and we lose the reference to the component. That does not mean that we cannot use event handlers with classes, we just have to bind our functions manually. Let's see what solutions we can adopt and in which scenario we should prefer one or another. As you probably know already, the ES2015 arrow function automatically binds the current this to the body of the function. So for example, this snippet. This gets transpiled into the next code with Babel. As you can imagine, one possible solution to the auto binding problem is using the arrow function. Let's see an example. This would work as expected without any particular problems. The only downside is that if we care about performance, we have to understand what the code is doing. Binding a function inside the render method has, in fact, an unexpected side effect because the arrow function gets fired every time the component is rendered. Firing a function inside the render multiple times, even if it is not optimal, is not a problem by itself. The issue is that if we are passing the function down to a child component, it receives a new prop on each update which leads to inefficient rendering and that represents a problem, especially if the component is pure. The best way to solve it is to bind the function inside the construction in a way that it doesn't ever change even if the component renders multiple times. This is the example here showing the same thing. I will align the code. That's it, problem solved. We will start with stateless functional components now. There is one more way to define our components and it is very different from the previous two. This method has been introduced in React 0.14 and it is very powerful because it makes the code easier to maintain and reuse. Let's see how it works and what it provides first and then we will dig into the cases where one solution fits better than another. The syntax is particularly short and elegant. Let's see an example. The code above creates an empty button and, thanks to the concise arrow function syntax, it is straightforward and expressive. As you can see, instead of using the create class factory or extending the component, we only define a function that returns the elements to be displayed. We can of course use the JSX syntax inside the body of the function. The next topic is props and context. Components that are not able to receive any props from the parents are not particularly useful and the stateless functional components can receive props as parameters like this. Alternatively, we can use an even more concise syntax with the ES2015 destructuring. We can define the props so that a stateless function can receive using the prop types attribute in a similar way as we do when we extend components. 
stateless functional components also receive a second parameter which represents the context. Moving on to the this keyword. One thing that makes the stateless functional components different from their stateful counterparts is the fact that this does not represent the component during their execution. For this reason, it is not possible to use functions like setState or lifecycle methods that are associated with the component instance. Next is state. The name stateless tells us clearly that the stateless functional components do not have any internal state, and the fact that this does not exist enforces it. That makes them extremely powerful and easy to use at the same time. The stateless functional components only receive props and context, and they return the elements. This should remind us of the principles of functional programming that we saw in the second section. Now we will see lifecycle. Stateless functional components do not provide any lifecycle hooks, such as component did mount. They just implement a render like method, and everything else has to be handled by the parent. Then we have refs and event handlers. Since there is no component instance, to use refs or event handlers with stateless functional components, you can define them in this way. Another difference of the stateless functional components is that, whenever we render them using the React test utils, we do not receive back any reference to the component. For example, here. In this case, the component represents our button. But in this case, the component is null, and one solution is to wrap our component inside a div tag, as shown here. 